Well, good morning again, church family. It's good to be with you again this morning. I wish I could say it's good to see you. I do have a a quick comment that I want to make about last week and something I was thinking about all throughout last Sunday. Uh, When you look at the New Testament, when you see the things that the Lord uh, allowed the early church to experience and you see the things that they endured, one of the things that the Lord allowed them to experience were events that kind of forced them out of their comfort zone. And so one of the things I was excited about last week was how not only our church, but churches throughout the country, churches throughout the world were kind of forced to go outside of our comfort zone and do something different. And the Lord sent us all out at the same time. I was thinking about the fact that, at least to my knowledge, that's the first time in American history when every church in the United States was essentially shut down or prevented from meeting at the same time. We weren't allowed to meet last Sunday in our traditional fashion, which forced so many churches to scramble and get creative and adapt and put things out online. And so one of the net effects of this crisis and all the things going on, at least in my mind, a positive spin that I have on it in my mind is the fact that it's forcing the church to go out in new ways and take advantage of modern means to be able to proclaim the gospel. So that's something I've been encouraged about this week. It's something even before we get into what we're going to look at today, I thought I'd just mention it really quickly because it's been on my mind and on my heart. And today, even as you're watching our video here and as you're, as you're participating with us online, I'd also encourage us to be praying for churches throughout the world that are getting into the process of doing this and becoming more adept at sharing the gospel in a digital way, sharing the gospel in an online platform. So thanks again for being with us this morning. Uh, This morning, we're going to be looking at two primary sections of Scripture, and we're going to be talking about something that allows us to look at the example of the early church. I I think that we can learn a lot of example or a lot of ideas or a lot of uh, encouragement. We could take a lot of encouragement from what we see taking place during the era of the early church that I want to focus on this morning And I want to encourage us to develop an others-centered mindset, because I actually believe that that's part of this path to sanity when you're in the midst of feeling cooped up or when when you're in the midst of feeling uh, like your routine has been interrupted. That's how I've been feeling over the course of this past week. You're probably feeling much the same. So we're going to talk today about this idea of this others-centered path to sanity that the early church illustrates for us. And I'm going to start off by reading for us from Acts chapter 4. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Acts chapter 4. I'm going to start at verse 32, and then I'm going to read down to verse 37. And then in a little bit, we're going to look at 1 John chapter 3. But for now, we're just going to start with Acts chapter 4, starting with verse 32. This is what it says. Now, the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, And no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to each as any had need. Thus, Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for giving us the privilege today to be able to carve out some time together with our families to be able to look at your word together and to meditate on the truths that you reveal to us in it. Lord, we're grateful for the example that we receive from you. And we're grateful for the example that you give to us through our brothers and sisters in Christ who've lived in generations prior to us. And we certainly see a great example in the believers who lived during the era of the early church. 
So as we think about the things that Scripture reveals to us about what was taking place among them, we pray that in the midst of our current context that we would be greatly encouraged and that you would, that you would inspire us to take action based on the type of things that we see in the lives of these believers. So, Lord, we commit this time to you now. We thank you, Lord, for this others-centered perspective that we see displayed among the believers of the time, and we commit this time to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. So one of the joys of being a follower of Christ is the privilege that he grants you to be part of his family, to be part of the church. There have been all sorts of reminders that I've received over the course of this week that I'm part of a church family, a great big church family. It's one of the, one of the great privileges that the Lord has given us as being believers. And so in Christ, all believers are united. We're united to Christ. Christ is the head of the church, and we are united to one another as the body of Christ. It's a privilege. It's a blessing. We're, we're united to one another throughout the course of this world. Scripture reveals to us that we were created by the Lord to operate in community. And we have the privilege to be a vital and beneficial part in, in one another's lives. That's something that the Lord has given us the privilege to experience. It's something the Lord's given us the privilege to do. But living in community with your brothers and sisters in Christ is not always a very easy thing to do. Sometimes that could be rather challenging. Sometimes I think our preferences uh, and our selfish tendencies can get in the way of our ability to live in community. I think sometimes as, an, as the result of an offense, it could be very easy for us to pull away from one another, maybe while we're still brooding about the type of things that have caused us to feel upset. I think other times it could be very easy for us to start losing sight of what's really important in this world. And as a result, we can just gradually drift toward investing our lives and our time into things that don't really matter instead of realizing that the Lord has equipped us and called us to invest our time and our lives in one another as part of the body of Christ and likewise to allow other people who are part of this body, part of this family, to make investments in us. This is something that the Lord brings up in multiple ways throughout Scripture. And I'm grateful that he doesn't just mention this as a concept in Scripture, but he also gives us great examples of what this looks like. And he gives us an example also of the, the kind of attitude that he wants us to develop as we try and foster that sense of community among one another. And as we look at those examples from his word, I think we can learn more about what it means to, to be in a spot where we start to recapture the heart and the mindset of the early church. And I think we could also, especially right now, maybe while we feel a little fidgety or feel a little cooped up, I think we could also start to understand that there is an others-centered path to sanity. And that's something we see displayed in vivid detail in the portion of Scripture that we're looking at today from Acts chapter 4, but we'll also see it in 1 John chapter 3 when we look at that as well. But one of the things that, that Scripture brings up for us that I think is extremely useful for us to understand when we look at Acts chapter 4 is that we need to let unity foster our generosity. And here's the slide right here to show you that. Let unity foster your generosity. Look at what it says in verse 32 down to verse 35. I'm going to reread those for us. And yes, I'm being a little bit of a wise guy this morning. Usually I have you here to feed off of as I make my uh, dad jokes and pastor jokes, but I don't have you here, so I just have to imagine you in my mind as I, as I joke a little bit with you today. But we want to let unity foster our generosity. And again, let me reread verse 32 of uh, Acts chapter 4, and then I'm going to jump to verse 34 and verse 35, but it says this, Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. Isn't that beautiful? And then when you jump to verse 34 of Acts chapter 4, it says, There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. So over the course of the past few weeks, I've had a lot of conversations with different friends and family members and, 
and uh, people who are part of our church family. And I was having a conversation with a friend the other day. Uh, He was uh, expressing his genuine concern about the ways that the current physical disruption of commerce and the ability to to, uh, get together, how that was impacting him personally, how this was impacting our culture. And I think all of us feel that pinch right now. All of us probably have a concern about that to one degree or another. And that same day that he and I were having that conversation, I happened to be online and I was going through uh, just some of my social media feeds and I was reading different things and seeing things. And I saw something that a friend of mine was doing at his church that sparked an idea for something that I thought we ought to do here. And I got the idea from observing the good example of others that that it would be nice for us to set up some sharing tables out on our front porch. Because what I was thinking was this, right now we're not able to gather together here in this building. You know, so there are days during the week, I'm the only one here. You know, I come here, I work in the office, and uh, I'm the only one here. And I was thinking about what we have on hand here in the church that there are genuine needs in the community that maybe we could meet with some of these things. And so I thought, all right, well, we've got a whole bunch of paper products that we have in reserve just for church activities. But again, we can't meet right now. So maybe we just find a way to give those away. And, and uh, we, you know, we've got paper towel, we've got other things, we've got some snacks, we've got some food. I thought, why don't we just put a table outside And we gathered some stuff from my house, too. We just put it outside. And and I invited the church that if you had anything you wanted to share with others, we'll just leave it on tables on the front porch of the church and load it up. And uh, I posted a video the other day, and I said, if you're going to do this, wait till at least 4 o'clock. Give me a chance to set these tables up before you show up. And a few minutes after 4, cars started to pull in with members of our church uh, showing up with some things to contribute to these sharing tables. And so now for the past few days, we've had these sharing tables with a variety, a variety of paper products and then canned goods and pasta and macaroni and cheese. And, and uh, I even saw salsa and chips and all sorts of good things, stew, cans of soup, all sorts of things being added to that. And since then, it's been shared throughout the community in a variety of platforms. And we've had people from the community calling the church, thanking the church for it, messaging us online, and showing up and making use of it, or joining our church family to help bless others. It's been something that's been very encouraging and very edifying, and I'd encourage you throughout the course of this week, do not hesitate to stop by and take advantage of what's on those, those tables. You don't have to wait till you're at a spot of dire need. You know, if there's something there that you can use, stop by, because somebody put it there to share it with you. They want to share it with you. So don't hesitate. Stop by. Gather what you need. Bless your family. Bless your neighbors. Bless whomever needs it. Just take it and share it because I suspect as soon as you create an open spot on those tables, someone else is going to come along and they're going to put more there to share. It's there to be shared. What an edifying thing throughout the course of this week to experience as our church family and our community partnered together to start meeting needs in this way and just blessing people in our community that can be blessed by it and want to be blessed by it. And when you look at what this scripture describes about what life was like for the early church, we see a high amount of generosity among them as well. They were generous people. These believers were in many respects, and keep this in mind, in many respects, they were living like outcasts in their society. Here we you know, are in the midst of a, a context where our, our, our community is partnering with us to do something nice. In their context, they were living like outcasts in their society. There was a lot of social pressure on them to reject Christ and to reconform right back to societal, societal norms, the things that the Lord had pulled them out of. They were being pressured to reconform to those things, but they didn't do that. Instead, what the scripture tells us is that they grew closer together in the midst of the pressure they were experiencing. And the Lord fostered genuine unity among them. They were united. They were on the same team. They understood that they were one body. They were part of the body of Christ, united to him as the head, united to one another as the body. And so the Lord continued to foster that unity among them. The scripture reveals. 
And in, in correlation with that unity, their generosity just continued and continued to increase. And people felt inspired to be even more generous and even more generous. And consider some of the results of that generosity as Scripture describes it here. We're told that within the church of the time, so keep in mind, this is a church dealing with all sorts of intense societal pressure, but within the church at the time, there were no needy people. Now, why were there no needy people? Well, the Scripture tells us that because the church was so grateful for the generosity they had received from Christ, they began treating everything that they owned as something that ultimately belonged to the Lord anyway. And so when needs were discovered among their brothers and sisters in Christ, they said, well, you know what, this thing that I have, it doesn't really belong to me. It's a stewardship entrusted to me. It really belongs to the Lord. So if my brother needs this, I'm going to share this with my brother. If my sister needs this, I'm going to share this with my sister. And they went out of their way to meet one another's needs. We have a perfect opportunity right now to live this out. This is the type of thing I believe God is calling us to live out right now. If we notice needs that exist among our brothers and sisters in Christ, if we notice needs among our neighbors in our community, perfect time to testify to what Christ has done in our lives by meeting the needs of those that he's placed in our lives. If we have something to share, let's share it. Uh, and let's do so to glorify the name of Jesus. We, we're even told here that some people uh, went even as far as liquidating some of their real estate holdings so that they could bless others with the proceeds. That was starting to become a common thing where people had land or property or, or different things that they had. They would liquidate what they had, and they would then share the proceeds with those that had needs. And, and I look at that, and I think that's a beautiful reality to consider. This wasn't activity that they were mandated to do. There was no government making them do this. This was the fruit of changed hearts. Their hearts had changed, and, and they wanted to be generous because Christ had been generous to them. And when a person gains a deeper understanding of who Christ is, and a deeper understanding of what Christ has done on their behalf, I think this becomes the outpouring of a life that recognizes Jesus as Lord. This is the manner in which a true family learns to care for one another. And so you have their unity fostering Christ-centered generosity. Something else that we see in this portion of Scripture, and we see this in Acts chapter 4, verse 33. You ready? There it is. We see that they testified to the power of Christ's resurrection. Verse 33 of Acts chapter 4 says this, And with great power the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Let me ask you a quick question. I know I can't hear your answer, but uh, just kind of think this through for a second in your mind. But what's your testimony? You know, what, what, what's your testimony? If you have to describe what's taking place in your life or what the Lord's done in your life, what do you testify to? What do you say in regard to, to what the Lord's been doing in your life over time? How can you testify to the fact that Jesus has been transforming you? What do you say if asked a question like that? And I bring that up because accurate testimony is a powerful tool in regard to spiritual matters. During the days of the early church, the Lord used the leaders that he was raising up in that particular context to testify to the resurrection of Jesus. So the apostles and many others were told uh, they were eyewitnesses of the resurrected Christ. They saw him with their own eyes after his crucifixion and after his resurrection. And uh, as they testified to the historical fact that Jesus rose from the grave. I'm also certain that they testified to the power and the significance his resurrection had in their life and has for all those who believe in him. So do we realize what Christ has accomplished for us when he rose from death? Do we realize the significance of what he was doing, what he was accomplishing for us? When Christ rose from death, when Christ rose from the grave, he proved he was God. He also showed us that sin's stranglehold over us has now been defeated. It's been removed. We don't need to be strangled by sin anymore. Sin's stranglehold has been defeated. We also know that Christ, through rising from the grave, 
He defeated Satan's control over our lives, meaning you and I no longer need to give in to the whims of Satan or the control of Satan because his control has been defeated. Christ defeated death's power over us through his resurrection. Christ also tells us and assures us that we too will rise again with new incorruptible bodies that can no longer experience pain, disease, or death, new bodies that are fit for an eternity in his perfect presence, and he secured this for us through his resurrection. I love what we're told in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 2. There it says this, For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. It's referencing this idea that we have a brand new body that's on the way. Our resurrection is assured because Christ rose from the grave and we are counted as in Christ. We are in Christ through faith in him. We are united to him. And so my question for us right now is how openly do we testify to this truth? And do our words and our lives regularly testify to the power and the effect of Christ's resurrection? And let me even say this about all of that. I think we're being given a platform right now to make this testimony in a powerful way while lots of new ears are listening. We have the privilege right now in a context where everyone's life seems like it's on pause. We've kind of exhausted our normal routines and we sit around right now and we're wondering, what do I even do with myself? We have the perfect opportunity right now while many people are listening to testify to the power of Christ's resurrection, to testify to what he's been doing in your life and what he has done in your life and what he continues to do in your life through his power, through his presence. Don't hesitate to testify to what, to what Jesus has done in your life. Don't hesitate to testify about who he is and how he has transformed you from within and made you brand new. Something else that Scripture brings up in Acts chapter 4, and I'll, I'll be referencing verses 36 and 37 in just a moment. But here it talks about this idea of, of being known for your intentional encouragement. Being known for your intentional encouragement. Look at what it says in verse 36 and verse 37. It speaks of a man named Joseph, and I'll just read it for us. It says, Thus Joseph, who is also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So think about that statement for just a second. It it, it tells us in regard to Barnabas, his his given name was Joseph. His nickname was Barnabas. He was known as the son of encouragement. That's what Barnabas means, son of encouragement. He was known for his intentional encouragement of others. And I think there's an example we can learn from what Barnabas showed us throughout his life, throughout his testimony. So um, over the past few days in particular, I've been in contact with family members. I've been in contact with friends. Some of the people I've been talking to uh, have felt kind of, uh, you know, just again, really cooped up and you start to get a little stir crazy when that's the case. And uh, I admit, the other night I was kind of feeling that same way. I was just, sometimes it hits you in waves, right? You have moments where you're, you're kind of fine, but then you have other moments where you start to think about all the things that you wish you were doing right now as the weather's starting to get nice and all the places I wish I could go to, but I can't go to right now because even if I went to it, they're not even open. And so sometimes that starts to get to me and can uh, rub me the wrong way. And the other night I was starting to notice that I was in a little bit of a mood. And uh, I'm just going to confess that to you, that, that sometimes there are moments in my life where I, I, I can easily get in that kind of a, uh, a spot where I recognize, all right, this isn't healthy. And there's a good tool or a good thing that, that I would recommend to you when we're talking about this idea of being others-centered that is displayed for us by Barnabas here, but it's something we could apply in our lives in very easy ways. And that's you want to get out of your head by focusing on other people. You got to get out of your head. So the, and a great way to do that is to focus on others. So I did something fun, and some of you think I appreciate the fact that you participated in this with me, but I, I just went on Facebook, and I put this statement out there. I didn't know if people were going to respond to this or not. I hoped that they would, but I put the statement out there, comment with your favorite movie, and I will comment back with 
just something about you that I've noticed that I genuinely appreciate. And uh, I put that up there, and then I was just kind of looking at my screen, and for a moment there was a pause, but then instantly people started commenting with their favorite movie, and it was one, two, three, four, and all of a sudden I thought, oh boy, <laughs> I, I've, got, I've got to get ready for some typing. And uh, before it was all said and done, 140 people commented. And I thought, okay, 140 people just commented on this, and I, want, I wanted to be genuine. I wanted to give some thoughtful commentary on this, and so I actually took some time and just thought through, what do I genuinely appreciate about this person? Is this a person I know in my day-to-day life now? Is this someone I haven't even seen for 25 years? What do I genuinely appreciate about this person? So I thought I'd be as honest as I could be. And I noticed at first my answers were short because I was thinking, all right, I got to get through a lot of these and I want to make sure I, I don't skip anyone. And then over time, I was enjoying it so much that I noticed my answers were getting longer and longer. And I, I thought, wow, this is so enjoyable. And it was, I hope that it encouraged those that I was trying to encourage, but I have to say that it also was extremely useful for me because it completely changed where my mindset was. My mindset was starting to get a little too contained, a little too overly self-focused, a little too woe is me, a little too, you know, overly focused on my inconveniences. And it took me from thinking like that to then putting me in a spot where I had to intentionally think about what do I genuinely appreciate about this person. And I thought, I'm going to give real answers to every one of these statements, and I'm not going to try and just glaze over it. And it put my mind in such a good spot that I I think for several days, even afterward, I've still been feeling good after being able to just share those things. Just put me in a really good spot, focusing on others that I'm grateful that the Lord has brought into my life, really reminded me of all that I have to be thankful for think, man, I have so many wonderful people that I get to share my life with. Just made me feel very grateful. I suspect that Barnabas kind of had those sorts of moments of realization where he realized, I'm just so grateful for this guy and for this guy and for this opportunity and for all the ways the Lord's blessed us. He, I imagine he was just a grateful man, and he invested that in the lives of other people. Uh, again, imagine being a Christian during the era of the early church. The culture did not share their values Christians were often arrested, they were often killed simply because they trusted in Jesus Christ and made his gospel known. And again, in the midst of that context, you have the Lord raising people up with the gift of encouraging others. He raised up Barnabas, and he raised up this man that they started calling the son of encouragement. And again, he was apparently so well known in that context for encouraging others that it just became his nickname. It became the thing that people knew him by. So what do you suppose the Lord wants us to learn from the example of Barnabas's life? What do you think the Lord would want us to take from that? Well, I think it's clear when you look throughout the book of Acts that Barnabas was passionate about helping others come to a personal and meaningful relationship with Jesus Christ. He wanted people to know Jesus. He wanted to invest his time and his efforts in helping people come to know Christ. So he would travel to do so. He would partner with other ministry leaders to do so. Uh, He would encourage his family to join him in doing so. And by the way, he was cousins uh, with Mark, Mark Uh, the man that wrote the Gospel of Mark, and Barnabas was his cousin. Barnabas would encourage him. Barnabas would support him. But what do you suppose life would be like among believers, among really all believers, if, if we all became known as intentional encouragers, like we see in a portion of Scripture like this, speaking about Barnabas? And so I, I kind of want to throw a challenge out, out there to you in, in, you know, with this in mind, but also with Uh, the experience I just had and kind of taking a risk to do something like this the other day, it really put my mind and my heart in a good spot. And I imagine that it would do the same for you as well. And so I want to just kind of ask you to think about something with all of this in mind. Is there someone that the Lord wants you to encourage with your words, but as of yet, you've been holding those words in? You've been holding it in, but yet there's somebody that the Lord wants you to take the risk to encourage. And I I can't help but wonder, you know, how might the Lord be seeking to bless someone else or prod somebody in a really healthy direction 
through the encouragement that he uses you to lavishly bless them with, to lavishly just just pour upon them. Don't go to the grave with a full tank of unspoken appreciation, a full tank of unspoken encouragement that you never took the risk to share. Share it while you have the opportunity to do so. Now, something else that we could see when we're talking about this other-centered uh, path being kind of like this path to, to sanity and, and Christ-centered thought, something else that we see, we, we find in 1 John chapter 3, and I, I want to show us a couple quick things from 1 John chapter 3 in line with what we just saw in, in uh, Acts chapter 4. But John takes this thought, and he encourages us to show our church family sacrificial love. Look at what it says in 1 John chapter 3, starting with verse 11. I'm going to read down to verse 15. In that passage, it says this, For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Don't be surprised, brothers, that, this, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. That's 1 John chapter 3, verse 11 down to verse 15. Now, the major, the major reason that our hearts, um, or let me say it this way, the, the major reason the hearts and the minds uh, of the early church were, were cultivating um, just this culture of love that they were experiencing in their context was because Christ had changed their hearts, and Christ had given them brand new minds. So they were seeing things, and they were thinking things all from a very different perspective. And it's very clear when you look at what Scripture tells us that in addition to that, it was also clear that the apostles were going out of their way to emphasize that this is the way believers were to treat one another, that we were to show each other sacrificial love, that we were to show each other that kind of concern and genuine care. And and basically, as Christ had shown us the ultimate example of sacrificial love when he gave his life on the cross, we as believers should follow his example by showing sacrificial love to one another. And the portion of Scripture that I just read from 1 John chapter 3, verse 11 down to verse 15, obviously it was written by the Apostle John, but if you know anything about the Apostle John, one of the things that he had a reputation for in that generation was, was being someone who would emphasize sacrificial love. He was known as just a very loving man who would encourage others to genuinely love one another. That was his reputation. In fact, when you look at the five books of the New Testament that John wrote, so he wrote the Gospel of John, he wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and he wrote the book of Revelation. Um, you can see that as the Holy Spirit inspired him to write those books out and to write those words down, All throughout those books, you see a repeated emphasis on the necessity of the church showing love to one another. We're encouraged to show love to one another as people who have been genuinely loved by Christ. And in the section that I just read in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 14, you have John actually stating that displaying sacrificial love toward one another is actually evidence that we have uh, truly passed from death to life, that the Lord's taken us from death where we were to life in Him. And the sacrificial love that we display toward one another is actually evidence that the Lord has done that work in our lives. So what he's saying here is that if you're looking for proof that you have actually experienced the blessing of salvation, showing sacrificial love to your Christian family is tangible proof that indeed Christ has saved you. That's what John's stressing here. It's the fruit of a changed heart. It's the fruit of gaining a genuine appreciation for Jesus Christ. We need to show our church family sacrificial love. But there's one other thing that I want to share with us right now, and this is where I want to finish up this morning, and that's this. When we love, so as we're showing this sacrificial love, as we do this, as we implement this, love in deed and truth. That's what Scripture tells us. If you look at 1 John chapter 3, starting with verse 16, down to verse 18, it says this, 
By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. So again, you know, as we look at this, I just want to point out one more time what John says here in 1 John 3, verses 16 to 18, because in this passage you have John, um, he's doing what he could to cultivate a culture of love among the early church, and he stresses that love is more than words. We can love in word, but he's saying love is more than just words. We want to love in deed. We want to love in truth. You know, we can tell others that we love them and, and let those words just merely hang in the air, or we can kind of make it a, like a one-two punch and, uh, and follow through with our deeds to show that what we said is actually real, to show that it's actually genuine. Jesus told us that he loved us, but we're convinced that he meant it because he laid down his life for us. And as Christ's family, when you look at what Scripture reveals to us, particularly this passage that we just read, we're being called to love one another in deed, we're, we're being called to love one another in truth, and to likewise take the overflow of that love and share it with everyone Christ brings into our path, to demonstrate it, to show it, to lay down our lives in small ways and in big ways for the benefit of those that Christ has given us the privilege to do life with. Now, there are many things in this world that try and grab our attention, many things that seek to compete for our affections. But when you look at these passages, when you look at what it told us in, in Acts chapter 4, giving us this example of the early church going out of their way to invest themselves in the well-being of one another. And then when you look at 1 John 3, where John encourages us in very tangible and practical ways to show sacrificial love to one another. I think we need to be reminded and encouraged to recapture the heart and the mindset that was prevalent in the lives of the, of the members of the early church. Our unity needs to foster generosity. Our testimony needs to point to the power of Christ's resurrection. Our words need to be encouraging. Our love needs to be sacrificial. And we want to use our deeds to confirm that everything that we're doing, everything that we're saying, that it's all genuine, just as Christ's love for us certainly is genuine. Again, I don't know where your mind is at right now, but I want, I want you to, in, to consider the things that are referenced in these portions of Scripture today, particularly if you've felt maybe a little too overly inward over the past group of days. If you've been in that spot, because I've hit that spot a few times, and I thought, all right, I don't want to stay there any longer. And the, the things that really help me get out of that are the type of things that I see in these portions of Scripture, where I say, you know what, I'm going to be intentional to take the focus off of me. And I want to start thinking about others. And I want to think about what it, you know, what it would mean to be Christ-centered and others-centered at the same time. So as the overflow of being Christ-centered, we want to be other-centered, showing his sacrificial love to one another. So there are a variety of ways that you could do that, and I know that the Lord will bring those things to your mind and to your heart uh, over the course of the coming days. So listen to his prompting as he gives you the, the nudge to do those things. But I want to finish up today with a real small, easy task that I hope, if you're watching this video, I hope you'll actually do. I want you to pick three people in your life, and they could be anybody. It could be somebody, you know, it might actually be fun if it's somebody you haven't talked to in a long time, somebody from your family, and then somebody from your friend group. And I want you to just take a moment and send them a text or a message on whatever platform they use, or maybe a phone call, um, and just tell them something you genuinely appreciate about them something you genuinely appreciate about them. I know it's a small thing, but it's the type of thing we can do from, from our homes while we're cooped up. Let them know something you genuinely appreciate about them and do so from the perspective of how grateful you are for having Christ in your life and the transformation that he's placed, that, he, that he's caused to take place in your life and for the people that he's brought into your life and he's allowed you to have community with. And out of the overflow of all of those blessings, 
intentionally bless somebody else. It's, the, it's this path to sanity, this, this other-centered perspective that Christ fosters among us. And it's something that we see demonstrated in very powerful ways in the lives and in the activities of the members of the early church. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for the privilege that you give to us to be able to look at your word and the privilege that it is to be able to study it together and think about the things that were taking place in the context when it was written. Thank you for the example of people like Barnabas and and the Apostle John and, and the early believers that were meeting each other's needs in a variety of ways or showing love to one another or offering some intentional encouragement. Lord, we want to do the exact same. And so, Lord, we pray that you would prompt us to follow through on that, that we wouldn't keep those things just in some sort of reserve bank that we never actually take the risk to share. So, Lord, we pray that today would be a day that we just pause for a moment out of our gratefulness to you. We pray that we would just invest a little bit about what you've invested in us into somebody else in some way, maybe just through a word of encouragement, sending them a quick message, reaching out to them and just saying, this is something I have always genuinely appreciated about you. And this is something that the Lord brought to my mind today about that. Lord, we pray that that would be something that maybe we would just follow up on that would help us get out of our own minds and help us to encourage somebody else at the same time. And Lord, again, we're grateful for the examples that you've given to us, but we're grateful for what you've accomplished on our behalf through your son, Jesus Christ. You've made us new people. You've united us to your son. You've united us to one another. And we're just grateful for the privilege to be able to experience these things. Lord, thank you that we could trust you in the midst of everything that's going on right now. We don't know every detail. We don't even need to know every detail. We don't know timelines. We don't know what to expect. We just kind of roll with it right now. But Lord, as we're rolling with it, we pray that we would roll as men and women who trust you. And we're just grateful that we have the privilege to do so in the midst of whatever we experience this side of heaven. So we just want to commit this day to your care. And we commit this week to your care. And by your grace, we pray that you would bring us together again soon so that we get to see each other's faces and enjoy fellowship, enjoy company, and make those investments in one another's lives that you've called us to make. We love you, Lord. We commit ourselves to you now, and we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I just want to say thanks again for being part of our online worship services today. Uh, In just a moment, if you stick around, we're going to have something for Children's Church that you'll see posted in just a few moments. Uh, I just want to thank our worship leaders and our tech people that are helping us pull these things off. I want to thank our church family for staying involved as best as we can. I know we've been having different group meetings that we've been utilizing Zoom and online platforms where we can still see each other's faces throughout the course of the week. And and, uh, it's limited, admittedly, but at least it's something. And again, thank you to those of you that have been participating in that sharing table that we've got on the porch. We're just going to leave it there and uh, continue to replenish it as best as we can while there's a need. Uh, So in the meantime, if you know somebody, you know, if you know a neighbor, if you know a friend, if you have a family member that you think even just to temporary relieve their budgetary concerns or whatever it may be, and they want to do some some grocery shopping here at the church, just tell them to stop by the church and literally take whatever they want. Just load up, take whatever they want, feed their kids, feed their family. We want to share as much as we can. And if we run low, I'll post something online and then we'll gather some more, and we'll share until we run out of stuff to share. And I think that our brothers and sisters who lived uh, two millennia ago as part of the early church probably right now be like, all right, right on. This is the way the church does this. So thank you for being part of that. Continue to lift each other up in prayer. Looking forward to seeing you online throughout the week, and stay uh, glued to our Facebook page and the church website because any important updates that that come our way. We'll be happy to share them with you there and let you know if there are any changes that we're able to make in coming days. But in the meantime, I love you guys, and I'm looking forward to being able to see your faces again soon. Have a wonderful week. Thanks. Thanks.